So I just want to um, open the meeting uh, right now and just say good morning, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Susan Chomba. I'm the director of um, Vital Landscapes at World Resources Institute, also just recently appointed as the global ambassador for climate action. So I'll be your facilitator for the first two sessions of this meeting and then Dr. Jen Jogona uh, from uh, Kefri will facilitate the last two sessions. So without further ado, I'd just like to hand over to, uh, um, to uh, sorry, I'm just trying to look at my program here, just a second, to Rose Akombo uh, from Kefri. Rose, kindly take over. Thank you, Susan. Good morning and a very warm welcome to our chief guest, Honorable Mohamed Elmi, the Chief uh, Administrative Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Professor Hamadi Mboga, the, the Principal S Secretary, uh, State Department of Crop Development and uh, Agriculture Research, Mr. Julius Kamau, the Chief Conservator of Forest, our distinguished guests, and all the audience. We are honored to have you join this webinar today on forest landscape restoration monitoring. My name is Rosa Combo. I head the climate change unit at Kenya Forest Service. I also coordinate a multi-stakeholder process that is developing a five-year forest and landscape restoration implementation action plan with support from FAO, Jeff funded the restoration initiative project. Indeed, it's my privilege to and pleasure on behalf of the Joint National FLR Monitoring Working Group to acknowledge your participation in the, this webinar today, your contribution and the contribution of your organization is key to the landscape restoration agenda in this country. It is key to the achievement of our national aspiration to increase tree cover by 10% and also to the reducing of emission from greenhouse gases from the forest and land-based sector by the year 2030. I want to let you know that we are living in one of the very best times in human history, where more opportunities in the business of ecosystem restoration and application of nature-based solutions dominates our efforts more than ever before. But the approach is different from the past. Hence the objective of this webinar, to develop a shared vision for a coordinated integrated forest landscape restoration and monitoring reporting framework mechanism for Kenya. This webinar is divided into four sessions and each session has an objective. The first objective our keynote speakers are calling for synergies, collaborations, and partnership in the development of forest landscape restoration projects, their implementation, monitoring, and reporting. In the second session, our speakers showcase existing national monitoring frameworks uh, that will uh, support the country to report on the national uh, commitment of 5.1 million hectares by 2030. In the third session, uh, our speakers, the speakers are sharing some of the existing monitoring platform and processes that contribute the national FLR reporting framework. And finally, the final session is an interactive and forward looking session where our session leaders will highlight the lesson learned gaps and way forward in FLR monitoring in Kenya. We therefore invite you for a fruitful discussion and feedback that could inform the goal of this webinar. I would like to end with a, an inspirational quote from Henry Ford, that our coming together today is the beginning and our keeping together is the progress and working together will be the success that this country is looking forward to as we uh, implement the restoration agenda. 
I welcome you all to this webinar and thank you for joining. Thank you. Susan, back to you. I think somebody is. Have we lost Susan? It seems that we may have lost Susan. Um, Dr. Duguna, would you like to step in? Y yes, I'll allow me to step in and uh, as, as we wait for Susan to come in. And uh, thank you all, our chief guests at uh, CAS and our PS, Maniboga, uh, CCF. And all you distinguished participants, welcome to this webinar today. We've been looking forward for it and we look forward to hearing the discussions from you. And without uh, further ado, I would like to call upon our CCF to start up our sessions with the opening remarks. And the CCF, we also request you to uh, invite the PS, uh, Professor Mandy Boga, who will th thereafter invite our chief guest to open the session. Welcome to see you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jogona. And I hope everyone can uh, hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. The Chief Administrative Secretary, Minister of Environment and uh, Forestry, Honorable Mohamed Elmi, the Principal Secretary, uh, Department of uh, Crop Development, uh, Professor Hamadi Boga, um, the moderators of this session, uh, Dr. Jane Jogona and Susan Chomba, members of the Joint National Working Group, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good I am morning. very pleased that we have all come together as partners and stakeholders in the forest and landscape sector to advance discussions on this important agenda towards a coordinated monitoring effort for forest and landscape restoration. Kenya has a national target, as you all know, to attain 10% tree cover by 2022. In addition, Kenya has international obligations to restore 5.1 million hectares of deforested and degraded landscapes under the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, AFR 100, and the Bond Challenge, and further, the vision of the UN Decade on, of Ecosystem Restoration 2021-2030. Kenya Forest Service, with the policy guidance of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and with complementary support from its partners, stakeholders, and communities, continue to implement several initiatives towards the attainment of these commitments in line with the national strategy on 10% recover. Allow me, participants, to highlight but a few some of the key interventions that we have been able to put in place. And I would say that from 2018 to date, not less than 374 million tree seedlings have been produced. This is from the Kenya Forest Service and also the other sector. The Adopt a Forest Initiative has been formulated under which approximately 18,000 hectares with a financial injection of about 36 million from the private sector have so far been adopted by various partners for restoration in the last one year. In the last three years, a total of 55,884 hectares of previously enclosed forest land has been reclaimed. KFS, with the support from the ministry, have also been able to expand the public forests via the gazettement since 2017. And so far, 109 hectares have been gazetted, with additional 20,000 hectares being processed for gazettement. More importantly, Kenya Forest Service continue to protect the existing 2.59 million hectares of gazetted public forest and further technically support the county governments in the conservation and protection of another 1.7 million hectares of community forest. To achieve this, KFS have employed various innovative forest management and protection tools. It is therefore paramount to effectively and accurately measure the contribution of these initiatives and of all other restoration efforts toward the attainment of the national target and the international obligation. This can only be achieved by putting an elaborate framework for tracking monitoring, assessing, and reporting progress towards the target. It is my conviction that this meeting will mark an important milestone toward achieving a coordinated process for tracking this progress. 
To this end, the government of Kenya through the Kenya Forest Service is providing leadership for a multi-stakeholder process of developing FLR Implementation Act Action Plan 2021-2025 with support from the FAO Jeff facility. The five-year plan aimed to restore deforested and degraded landscapes for the Syrian socioeconomic development, improve the ecological functioning and contribute to the realization of the national aspiration and international obligation in the forest and land-based sectors. In this action plan, we have set a goal of to put 2.55 million hectares of deforested and degraded landscapes under restoration through integrated forest and landscape restoration approaches for improved multiple ecological functions, increased resilience and socioeconomic benefit by 2025. The plan proposes an integrated monitoring and reporting framework to report all the restoration efforts in the country and a joint national FRL working group or task force to coordinate the monitoring and reporting processes. The aspiration for this webinar, which is to develop a shared vision for coordinated and, inter and integrated forest landscape restoration, monitoring and reporting framework and mechanism for Kenya requires commitment and or our collective efforts as government, partners, landowners, and experts, and the deployment of appropriate tools, approaches, and technologies for monitoring and reporting so that we can jointly deliver on the restoration targets. The Kenya Forest Service remain committed and ready to provide leadership in supporting a monitoring framework that would track progress and report on conservation, protection, restoration, tree growing, and sustainable management of forest and landscape resources. Finally, I wish to thank the, the Joint National Working Group for organizing this webinar and further register my appreciation on behalf of the Kenya Forest Service for the cordial and mutual cooperation and collaboration we have received from our stakeholders and partners in executing our mandate and further call upon others in this sector to coll collaborate with us on various aspects of monitoring efforts that include forest resource assessment, especially to be able to access high resolution satellite imageries to support accurate determination of the current forest and tree cover, innovation of new technologies and solutions, training of staffs, data collection, system development, among others. Thank you. And now it's my honor and privilege to invite the Principal Secretary, State Department of Crop Development and Agricultural Research, Minister of, Environment, uh, Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperative, Professor Hamandi Boga to make his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Elmi, the CAS, uh, and all the colleagues here from the Ministry of Environment, from ICRA, uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture, and other stakeholders. I think uh, uh, I'm happy to participate in this conversation about forest landscape uh, restoration, forest and landscape restoration. I think this is a very vital exercise that we all need to own and internalize and make sure that it is implemented because we don't have our choice anyway. Because as uh, the landscape continues to be degraded, it is impacting on many of our livelihoods. And so I think uh, concerted efforts need to be put in place between the counties, between the citizens, between the relevant ministries, and I'm talking about the Ministry of Lands, the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives, and the Ministry of Environment. And all Kenyans, basically, they need to be conscious that we exist because we benefit from ecosystem services. And once we degrade these ecosystems, most of our issues will become even tougher. Climate change is already real. And uh, as we degrade the landscape, we are exacerbating the effects of climate change. And so I think uh, it's important that every now and then we have these regular sessions to have a conversation about how to walk back uh, from the brink. Uh, I think uh, as a Ministry of Agriculture, we contribute a lot to landscape degradation because of our farming systems. I think we need to rethink our farming systems. And this is made even more complex because agriculture is devolved. So we have to walk lock in step with the counties as they do their spatial plans 
we need to make them aware about sensitive ecosystems. And so all of us have to work together so that sensitive ecosystems are protected properly by everybody and, uh, and every stakeholder and uh, degraded ecosystems are restored and it becomes a collective effort of communities and of counties and of the national government and also development partners. And then what is left as agricultural land is also in, managed in such a way that it doesn't lead to degradation. And there are many ways in which agriculture contributes to degradation. Some of the tools and methods that we employ actually fuel degradation of both the soil and the environment. For example, there is an age old tool that we use called the disc plow. Uh, I think we need to have a serious campaign to, to stop the use of the disc plow. It has on the soil, it loosens the soil, it, uh, makes, it makes soil lose fertility, and it also makes soil lose soil carbon, it makes soil also lose water. And yet we, we, we use it so routinely that it has become part of our culture. And I think part of the conversation from the ministries and the counties that deal with agriculture has to, to, to address this issue. I know there is a master plan which was developed on landscape restoration, which divided our landscapes into forests, into woodlands, and into agricultural lands and other areas. I think part of the challenge we have is to sensitize people about this landscape restoration plan because it's quite comprehensive. And it maps, I think, where all these uh, degraded landscapes are. And I think if we can find a formula and resources to work together to implement that plan would be uh, very, very important. Right now, I'm outside here in Molo looking at uh, at uh, pyrethrum farming so i will not be able to stay throughout the workshop but i look to forward to the recommendations of the workshop but ever since i came to the ministry of agriculture i have tended to have a landscape view of what we are doing and how it's impacting on the ecosystem and i've also tried to work with the ministry of uh, environment uh, to work together so that we can practice agriculture that respects the environment and uh, makes sure that you know, uh, we have forests, we have agriculture, and we have settlement that is in harmony with itself and in harmony with the nature. So we have been working together on sock knot together with the Ministry of Environment and other NGOs and development partners. And hopefully the lessons from there can be taken to other landscapes and other ecosystems. I, I think right now where we stand, we have a, a very robust GIS technology uh, with various institutions and uh, GIS capabilities that can tell us where is what and what is happening in which ecosystem, so that as we uh, plan restoration, we are not moving blind, but we are guided by information, especially geographical information. I think it's a very important tool in the exercise that we want to undertake. And I would like to appreciate ICRA. They have been talking about landscapes. They have been talking about agroforestry. Right now, uh, there is a process of merging C4, and ICRAF, uh, C4 was dealing with forestry mostly, while uh, ICRAF was dealing with the uh, agroforestry in uh, agricultural lands. The merger of those two shows that uh, it's important to, to think about it in a holistic manner because it's forests that turn into agricultural land and so on. And uh, the, the two, ecosystems tend to impact each other. And so the knowledge from C4 craft 
should also be used to guide our interventions, the many years of knowledge that they have accumulated over years in different countries and different experiences and the data that they have about the different landscapes in Kenya can be quite useful in, in uh, enabling us uh, uh, tackle this very serious dilemma of livelihood versus conservation. And uh, hopefully we'll find a balance that will make sure that uh, uh, we don't focus too much on livelihood at the expense of the environment, which is necessary for supporting livelihood. So I think let me stop there and wish all the participants uh, fruitful deliberations. I request to be allowed to eject out of here so that I can hand all these uh, pyrethrum stakeholders. Pyrethrum was one of the sector which went to zero, but now we have uh, working with private sector companies to revive it so that we can diversify the income sources from our, for our farmers in the areas of Molo. So right now I'm in Molo, uh, but uh, I wish all the partners good deliberations. My colleagues from Ministry of Agriculture will take whatever resolutions uh, so that we can do our part. Thank you very much and over back to you, moderator. Thank you so much, Professor Hamadi Boga. That was excellent. Um, and uh, as uh, CCF mentioned here, that we will just quickly move to the uh, CES uh, Ministry of Environment. Honorable Elmi, please um, join us. Uh, thank you, Susan. First, um, to recognize the PS and his contribution and the Kamau that was from KFS who have spoken before me, and all the ones who are uh, on this webinar to say welcome and thank you very much for all of you joining and uh, to thank the organizers for um, organizing this very important uh, uh, webinar. It is important because as uh, PS said, we have an elaborate plan for landscape restoration and uh, we don't hear much about it. And therefore, trying to monitor it and to see the outcomes will be one way of forcing us to actually look at our plans if necessary, uh, adjust them. I would say that um, it is very important that all actors collaborate on this, it is critical. Um, Kenya was among the countries that actually championed a decade of restoration. So basically we're already um, one quarter of 2021 has gone and 2030 is not very far. We know how timelines go. And therefore setting up a proper framework for monitoring calls for first really relooking our plans and those plans being known by and being acted on by the people on the ground. It means uh, we have to, in fact, when we say forests and landscape restoration, forests are also on landscape. I, I would actually say we have a landscape to restore. We have one of them is forests. Another one is, as somebody has said, the, the woodlands, others are farmlands, rangelands, and therefore first decide, you know, where are these degraded lands and uh, are they in forests, are they wherever they are, and decide these are the ones we are going to restore and we'll restore three in three years this and we have to have a time frame. And once we have that, and then we say who is responsible and really it means us training the people right in the field who are going to do the restoration and which method are they using to restore? Is it communities who are restoring by refusing like in pastoral areas to set aside an area which they don't graze on for some time, which they have done traditionally? Is it uh, the farmer saying that, you know, I'll change the use of this land until it is restored? So we really need to know what is it that we are restoring, which means uh, the plans, our restoration plans must be known and must have people who are doing it and must have lead. And I was suggesting that we must have maybe put the country into clusters and then decide which clusters uh, are restoring and each county, what are they restoring? Is it a ward this year or is it two wards? And uh, how degraded is it? And coming to the monitoring, I think then, and that, therefore in every cluster having a lead organization who volunteers and they must have a minimum 
capability to do that means they are mobile they have, can do minutes and they can jo they jointly agreed monitoring they can actually take it to the ground train the staff of the various actors in that uh, area because not all actors will be in in, in every county and therefore whichever the, is the lead and then they make sure they do it having done that then our monitoring framework um, in my view should be simple should be something that is agreed on by all actors so that we don't have to do different uh, uh, sheets and maybe i mean additional places where it is required but really have a very simple monitoring tool that all these experts who are here now will and the smaller team who are going to work on it agree on and uh, that is then taken down and uh, continuously revised to make sure it is relevant and is giving us the right uh, points and show clear progress uh, towards our commitments. I think at the moment, uh, being here in the Minister of Environment, I'm not sure we've made much progress towards, uh, you know, the, the 5.1 million hectares that we said we will restore. Uh, whether it's in forest, whether it is maybe a little bit more on the forest because of the 10% uh, drive, 10% um, tree cover drive that is going on. But when we think of the grasslands, actually, I believe they're getting more degraded. Uh, I believe our desert, that is uh, Chalvi Desert, the only one in this region, is expanding. And uh, anybody who visits those areas will see that it's encroaching in uh, huge tracks of uh, rangeland and therefore making droughts more severe, communities less, uh, uh, should I say, um, resilient. And therefore, and yet it is possible to restore those areas. So uh, this is a much welcome uh, uh, webinar. And I would urge you that uh, very soon uh, we break down uh, our activities into the clusters of the country and then list the counties, decide which departments in different counties will lead, uh, whether it is um, in the forest, it will be KFS and probably even some more. And let's look for who's leading and put it all on our map. And then maybe in a month's time, when we have all the monitoring tools and everything ready, we can come back together and say, this is the different roles everybody's taking. And with those uh, remarks, I would like to say, wish everybody well, I'll be listening in. And uh, towards the end, um, I'll probably make a few more comments, as the program says. And just to bring you the greetings of uh, Dr. Kipto, our peers, who was to be here, and he went for a barrio. Thank you. Thank you so much, C.S. Elmi, and what a lively opening session. I'd just like to recap a little bit on what the key speakers in that session have actually mentioned there. CCF started by uh, really highlighting some of the fantastic restoration opportunities and activities that are being led by KFS, and especially showing us that there's already a commitment of 2.5 million hectares under the new uh, forest landscape restoration plan, but also, which means that with a country uh, commitment of 5.4 million hectares, we are still left with 2.9 million hectares, which is we should be asking, where will those ones uh, be restored? And then, uh, uh, you know, the um, agriculture uh, CS uh, came strongly there and told us a little bit about some of the of, of the of, of the pressures that agriculture puts on forests and and how we should be considering restoration, not just in forest lands, but also in agricultural lands. And so calling really for that kind of uh, interest sectoral coordination, but also showing the uh, ability for us to meet those uh, restoration targets through integrating agriculture ecosystems and really acknowledging that agriculture can uh, and should be part of our restoration agenda. And so really, and, and then the CS uh, Ministry of Environment, Honorable Elmi, thank you so much for also calling for clustering of where we want to do restoration, identifying uh, important restoration uh, activities that are suitable for these areas and also working together. So I think uh, without further ado, I'd just like to thank you so much for those very uh, important opening remarks from that session. And uh, uh, also, uh, you know, really thank you so much for your time and for commitment, for showing strong commitment, commitment from the government agencies, from the ministries for, inter, for, for landscape restoration, intersectoral coordination, 
And really are just saying that you're giving us the, the, the motivation and inspiration to keep moving as other partners in this journey. I think the key thing about this webinar is we really want to have an integrated uh, monitoring and, and reporting system for restoration so that we can be able to say how much is happening. But also as we think about it, you've reminded us that we also need to think about where we are restoring, how we are restoring, and how we can be able to coordinate and integrate these activities. So thank you so much for that. We are now going to move to the next session here, uh, which is um, brilliantly, we are going to look at uh, showcasing some of the uh, methods and tools for mo and monitoring frameworks for FLR. And just to mention that we are going to have it opened by Yvonne Yokabi from Climate Change Directorate, Ministry of Environment. And why did we ask the Climate Change Directory to come and be part of us? It's because again, just to mention, Kenya is one of the countries that has already submitted their revised NDCs. That's the nationally determined contribution. And it's very important to acknowledge where this government and where Kenya as a country is taking leadership. Not many other countries have managed to do that. The revised NDCs were supposed to be submitted by 2020 and the climate change directory has managed to do that. And we are aware that they are being able to monitor the kind of emission reductions and targets in different uh, sectors. So we can learn uh, the monitoring, the forest landscape restoration can learn from the climate change directory so that we are also moving at a great pace. So Yvonne, without much, much further ado, please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Susan. Um, yes, I think my presentation has been loaded. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Buenas Cas and um, CCF KFS, Mr. Julius Kamau. Thank you for allowing me to present. I wish to take a short time in the presentation. My name is Yvonne Yokabi. I'm a climate change specialist working with UNDP. Uh, but has been working very closely with the Climate Change Directorate in the uh, design and operationalization of an integrated monitoring, reporting, and verification system. Um, the monitoring, reporting, and verification system is a system that will allow us to deliver both on monitoring, reporting of greenhouse gas emissions and mitigation activities, as well as monitor and evaluate adaptation activities, as well as enablers, which includes finance and knowledge management, capacity building efforts that are happening in the country. The system, as we call it integrated, brings together all these joints um, so that we are able to provide guidance on the response actions that have been undertaken within the country, whether in the form of policies, projects, programs, or business ventures. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Climate Change Action Plan 2018-2022 paints a grim picture of the effects of climate change and it states that for the period 1990 to 2005, Kenya was losing about 12,000 hectares of forests annually. Um, we have been having 58, about 58 deaths um, for a period up to 2016 uh, from floods and droughts. So as you can see, please go back to the previous slide. This, this, has response, uh, this, this type of data allows us to know what types of response actions are required either to be catalyzed um, to be ignited where there's no action being undertaken, and this can only come from the data. Secondly, is to note that Kenya belongs to a community of nations and is a party to the convention, the UNFCCC, and so we have obligations at international level to report on what actions we are undertaking, and this is in the form of what we call national communications that are reported and submitted every four years. Unfortunately, we've only been able to do two reports to UNFCCC, and biennial update reports that also showcase how fast we are moving towards our, our commitments. Then as Dr. Chomba has highlighted, Kenya has been one of the most progressive countries in, in, in making a commitment and even updating that commitment in the form of its nationally determined contribution. And we know that Kenya has made a commitment of 32% reduction of emissions against a business as usual scenario uh, by the year 2030. And so it's very important then to track how fast Kenya is, um, you know, making progress on this implementation of its commitments and what could be the handicaps in the case that it is experiencing any challenges so that you can get, we can get further support and accelerate action in the sectors that will be contributing to these NDCs. And we know that the forestry sector is one of those sectors that has been showcased as being one of those that will produce the most results for the country. And finally, the country wants to demonstrate yeah, our ability to receive climate finance. Um, and, and you know, this 
MRV system then allows us to track the finance that we are receiving from international and you know, domestic resources. A recent report showcased <clears throat> that 70% of our finance is going to mitigation actions. And so this allows us to show that you know, adaptation is heavily underfunded and this then will allow us to make an appeal for more financing uh, for this, this particular sector. If many of you followed the, the discussion yesterday on the climate summit, you could see commitments being made from private sector players, governments, multilateral development banks on helping us accelerate our financing. And so Kenya has developed this um, integrated MRV framework that will allow us to have reporting from all from five components, which I'll showcase. Um, the first being the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory, which gives us an estimation of our emissions as a country from five sectors, um, namely energy, forestry, and land use sector, agriculture, industry, waste, and, 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 and um, livestock sector. So the greenhouse gas inventory is very keen on getting data from in the form of what we call activity data. And this activity data is, for example, the amount of fuel being used for, for different vehicles on the road, the number of livestock that we have in the country. And once we get this data, we are able to compute in a model what our emissions are as a country. For the inventory that has just finished um, 1995 to 2015, the forestry sector was our main contributor of emissions through deforestation. And this was the from forest land being converted into grasslands and contributed about 22,000 gigagrams of carbon dioxide. So that data in itself showcases that efforts to you know, restore our forests um, and, and is very important and paramount to helping us reduce our emissions in as much as in the arena, we contribute only 1%, less than 1% of emissions. The second component is on mitigation actions. And here we are very keen on finding out what type of actions have been undertaken in the country and what progress is being made. It allows for different methodologies to be applied in as, in some, in as much as um, different methodologies are used to compute uh, mitigation outcomes. And so this allows us to submit reports um, to allow us to verify that the, 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 the data that we are, be, we are receiving from different sectors is accurate. Finally, we have, sorry, on the third component, we have tracking of adaptation actions, which you know takes a bit longer, but we have to first get a list of all the adaptation actions being taken in the country, where they are being taken and, and find out what impacts they are having on socioeconomic um, fronts. MRV, I've seen a question, MRV stands for monitoring, reporting and verification. Climate finance, of course, is the second, com the fourth component, which has a tracking of what types of resources are we receiving in the country? And, and we want to understand where this finance is going. Like I mentioned, we have already tracked um, for the period up to 2019. And that showed that, you know, 70% of our finance is going to mitigation actions. And so there's a deficiency in funding of adaptation action, which you know, as a developing country is our priority. And so this type of data allows us to know you know, where do we need to catalyze actions? And finally, we want to understand the nexus between climate change and sustainable development goals. And so this, this platform allows us to track what kind of impacts the actions that we're undertaking in the climate change front are having on the different SDGs in as much as we have a dedicated SDG on climate change action. And so, for example, if for those who are in Kenya, you would remember that we have had a uh, rise in lakes uh, that have resulted in flooding in some parts of the country. And we could see that this affected children's uh, education because schools were flooded. And so you can see climate change does have a nexus on different um, SDGs. And so you, from that, you can as assess what, what actions will be taken to address that flooding, for example, and how we need to improve on the education sector, for example. And so once you put in all this data, we come up with various reports so that we can meet both domestic and international uh, reporting requirements. And so that we can also push for transparency, which is a principle in the climate change arena. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out yes. of time. I've actually yes. been very generous on time here. So um, I just requ kindly request that we move to the next presenter. Thank you so much. I think we are taking key points there in terms of an integrated uh, monitoring uh, framework from the climate change sector. And that really shows that we can do it also on the, on the FLR side. So thank you so much, Yvonne. 
Um, just uh, to uh, clarify that the, the people who are listening, our participants, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A as well as uh, like or vote for the questions that you'd like to be addressed. We know we are really running out of time, uh, but we'll try to squeeze in some minutes for uh, picking a few questions and, uh, and posting them to the, to, to, to the presenters. So put your questions in the Q&A and keep voting for the ones you'd like to see answered. And let's go, go to the next presenter here, Richard Mwangi from Kenya Forest Service, who'll be talking about the National Forest Monitoring System. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Mwangi from Kenya Forest Service. Uh, I, I work as a GS developer in Kenya Forest Service. I'll be doing a presentation on national forest monitoring. Uh, basically, we, are, we, we have a platform that is called Forest Information Platform, which, which is a relational database management system for visualization of the, uh, GIS datasets and for answering to red plus questions. This contributes uh, also, this is just a platform, part of a national forest monitoring system. This platform uh, is used uh, for, it has FRL, it has, um, also we, have, we are also in, the, in discussion with Madam Rosa Combo on adding the issue of uh, forest and, and landscape restoration monitoring. And we have already added in the, in the, in the platform and this platform uh, is used for monitoring both the deforestation and degradation. And um, this platform also uses a, a citizen science to monitor the near real-time uh, forest change uh, and real-time forest change. Can we go to the next slide? I want to take more, uh, less time so that I can be able to do a two minutes demo of the system. Uh, this system has a, a mobile GIS and uh, web GIS, where you can be able to access information on KFS uh, portal, where in the, in the KFS portal, we have the, the forest information platform, which uses both citizen science and uh, mo uh, mobile GIS for reporting, where people from the uh, community forest association and uh, forest rangers and uh, other stakeholders can be able to report on real-time and near real-time basis. Next slide. Uh, this system has a uh, FRL and then it has a uh, MRV and then it has safeguard information. Uh, all this is contributes towards uh, issues to do with the red plus uh, in, in Kenya and sustainable forest management. Next slide. Uh, the system is helping Kenya Forest Service in the monitoring of deforestation degr and degradation. This system is also helping uh, in the for forest and landscape uh, restoration monitoring. Uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in the process of designing a, a, a module that will be able to monitor in real-time basis where somebody will be able to know what we are restoring in terms of forest cover. And as our CCF was saying that we, are, we have a 5.1 uh, commitment as a country, it will be able to, to monitor in terms of five, the 5.1 uh, million hectares, where are we in terms of the, that 5.1? Point one monitoring, and then the, the system is also using citizen science to to monitor forest cover change, and uh, and also this system has uh, public documents, and uh, the public can be able to go into the system and be able to download uh, this, uh, documents on issues of red and on issues of forest restoration. Can I be able to share my screen, please? Uh, unfortunately, because of time, um, Richard, I'm not sure that we can be able to share screen right now. We had allocated mm -hmm. five minutes per presenter, so kindly just bear with me. Uh, what we'll do is we'll move to the next presenter and we can consult on the panelists in terms of sharing screen. So let's just move to the next presenter and uh, uh, Zanel will get back to you in terms of sharing screen, yeah? Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we will move uh, sorry, my screen is also moving. Uh, we will move to the last presenter of this session now, Sheila Mbiru, head, head of Knowledge Management from Kenya Forest Service, and she'll also take us through the Forest and Landscape Restoration Portal from KEFRI. Sheila, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chomba. Uh, good morning, all. My name is Sheila Mbiru, um, the head of Knowledge Management at Kenya Forestry Research Institute. 
CAFRI. CAFRI is funded by Jeff through FAO to implement a project um, to restore ourselves and under, under the restoration initiative. And one of the outputs includes development of a national forest landscape restoration knowledge management system, an online interactive dynamic portal where uh, we collate, uh, store, and avail forest landscape restoration information and knowledge. And um, the overall uh, objective um, is to centralize the management of FLR knowledge in Kenya. And um, the specific objectives would be to provide a one-stop shop online platform for FLR knowledge sources, products, services, and restoration initiatives in Kenya. We've heard even from um, uh, our two honorable PSs and the previous presenters that there's um, a lot already going on in the FL uh, forest landscape restoration uh, space. And so uh, this uh, system will provide a one-stop shop online platform. We also want to share uh, FLR information and knowledge among stakeholders, that's partners, um, um, citizens, uh, the community, and um, also to connect people to um, FLR institutions, who is doing what, the experts and projects and initiatives. And then finally, to provide a platform uh, for national monitoring and reporting on FLR. So basically to have one centralized monitoring tool, a, a lot has been done, a lot is being done. How can that be embedded within a national forest landscape restoration knowledge management system? So uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, so as far as um, preparation towards developing this uh, knowledge management system, carefully spearheading the process. And so far uh, we've been able to review and map existing knowledge, existing knowledge um, initiatives and platforms linked to FLR in Kenya. We've seen there's a lot of knowledge products, publications, maps, atlases, reports, um, you know, such as the reports Yvonne was talking about. Um, how can we um, make this available? We also looked at um, initiatives uh, such as the forest landscape me mechanism, among others, and um, looked at the platforms, SLEEK, um, Kenya Climate Change Knowledge Portal, the East African uh, Community Knowledge Portal, just to understand what, what has been done. And so we will build upon what, what, um, what has been done. Also, we have looked at the SWOT analysis of identified knowledge sharing portals. One of the portals that we were, that was identified as, as, as a, a benchmark is the Kenya Climate Change Knowledge Portal, which is, um, which is uh, under the Ministry of Environment and forestry under the climate change directorate. So looking at um, you know, uh, uh, best practice in terms of knowledge sharing portals and what we can learn from existing portals. Uh, so um, to do this, a committee um, will be constituted or is in the process of being constituted um, to, and we'll have representation from national and county government, from NGOs, private sector and the community so it will be it will have a national outlook and so this committee um, already we've identified 11 institutions to form this uh, committee and uh, so far letters have been you know written out to invite these institutions to send representatives to this committee we've received from two institutions we are following up so that we can have all the institutions represented and then constitute the committee and be able to start um, actually the, the, the work of developing this, um, this uh, knowledge management system for forest landscape restoration. And of course, one of the things uh, you know, the committee will do will be to um, discuss uh, the roadmap, the design and content of, of the forest landscape uh, knowledge management system. So in terms of, uh, next slide please, in terms of um, an, uh, sort of a schematic illustration, of course, the proposed committee will go further into this, but um, we we'll look at a system that will be available publicly. However, um, to be able to uh, either collate, contribute, um, collaborate, um, um, and access the information, one would have to register. The registration will be for either individual members or institutions. And once registered, of course, you'll go through an approval system and you'll be able to log into the system. And um, in terms of what you can do, of course, we want to look at institutions, the projects, data, information, knowledge, uh, looking at the publications, the maps, the photos, the videos, interviews, success stories, and lessons learned. There'll be an events calendar um, so that people know who 
what is happening, who is doing what, and when they can get involved. And then, of course, very important will be an expert um, uh, profiles, project profiles, and institutional uh, profiles in the forest landscape restoration space. And then uh, ability to share knowledge and collaborate will be discussion forums, and then, of course, communities of practice. And as always, um, the, uh, there will be a verification and approval process before any content can be uploaded. And of course, this is where we will need um, experts in these areas to go into the approval process. Finally, once Thank they- Thank you, Sheila. Sheila, pub... kindly summarize. Summarize kindly, Sheila. Um, and of course, you can comment, social media sharing, downloading, and have F FAQs. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. That was a wonderful, again, uh, overview of the uh, knowledge management platform that is being set up uh, by uh, Kefri and other partners. I'd like just to mention that, um, you know, it, there, there's, there's, there's a tendency we want to give a lot of details for this webinar, but we'll have a bigger seminar for more details. I think for now we wanted to look at uh, monitoring and restoration uh, uh, frameworks and tools that different institutions have. So I'll pick one question here uh, from John Witton in the uh, question Q&A. The role of communities in the restoration plan is critical given the scale, opportunity to understand community priorities and change to existing practices that impact on ecosystems. So I think the question that John is asking here um, is, um, sorry, did I miss it? Um, So what the role of communities in restoration plan is critical given the scale. Uh, what opportunities and uh, uh, do we understand community priorities in the restoration process? So I'd like to uh, pose this question over to uh, CCF if he's uh, here, if he's still on. Uh, CCF, kindly tell us how we are engaging communities in restoration process uh, in the country. Uh, thank you, Susan. I hoped that that question didn't come this direction. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think um, as Kenya Forest Service, we have a very strong, um, very strong en engagement and uh, participation uh, framework with the forest adjacent communities. That is for sure. I, I think uh, in terms of government agencies that have a framework that is actually legally recognized, I think FS comes among the first. And uh, I think what we what we believe is that the communities have a great role in terms of uh, restoration and in terms of advancing the this restoration agenda. Of course, we look at it from both sides. One, they act as you know as our closest partners and allies in protecting and managing whatever we have today on the public forest. But also, we have now also tried to en emphasize that they need to have some restoration plan and activities along their landscapes. And what you'd notice is that most of the seedlings production is happening, yes, within your, our jurisdiction, but also we are encouraging that those seedlings also be planted on their farmlands. And what also we have a deep conversation is also making sure that the tree seedlings that we are engaging with, and that's why it's good to engage with them and hear them, they, those trees must speak something to them. It is not possible that we're going to sustain the community goodwill on their own farmland, which is a, their own investment, to plant trees just for the mere conservation. They must be able to see that tree for fruit. They must be able to see that tree for shade. They must be able to see that tree for firewood and biomass generation. They must see it as something that will help them sustain their water sources within their landscape. And therefore, the, the greater issue that for planning has to be integrated is that we must be able to seek and understand the aspirations of the communities. The only way they, they will have a sustainable approach is if we speak to those to those aspirations. And that's what Kenya Forest Service is doing. I think we have learned our lessons for the last 13 years, uh, engaging with the communities. We continue to learn. And I think every day is a learning exercise on how best we can engage with the communities to be able to advance the restoration agenda. I would want to keep it as, as that, but I'm, I'm available to provide more insight to the same subject. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, CCF. And of course, we know, you know, we have uh, the community forest associations that work very closely with KFS across the country. And we are looking also at aspects of engaging them with the county level. So thank you so much. There are so many questions and I'd really uh, suggest and encourage 
uh, the participants, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the presenters to go to the Q&A and trying to answer some of these questions. Fantastic questions here. I'm just going to pick one more from John Dixon, who asked, what type of cross-institutional mechanisms are most effective for linking various concerned ministries for coordinated planning, implementing, and monitoring? I think, um, again, uh, this question will probably go to the higher uh, government agencies. And if maybe the, P the, the PS here for environment is listening, um, you know, uh, P uh, a CS, sorry, Elmi, kindly, if you're listening, what kind of cross-institutional mechanisms are most effective for linking various concerned ministry so that we have coordinated planning, implementation, and monitoring of restoration? Honorable Elmi, um, please help us to just go through that question. I, I think for me, not necessarily only this one, my experience is that the lower you go, the, is, the more effective where people see the benefit of actually working together. It is important that there is a national mechanism that uh, enforces that if one or two of the actors do not actually uh, follow what has been agreed. And therefore to get the institutions to work, for example, that's what I was saying, if we had clusters, we knew who is the lead, who are the members, and one of the members is there, and then they can bring it to their national level lead to say, we have a problem here, can we sort it out? So for me, the, the, the other important thing about uh, people collaborating is the collaborating people must find benefit in being a member of that group. They must, they, it, the group should not be one which competes among themselves. It is, they must see that everybody is bringing something a role and therefore it, it is, and in this case, it's actually necessary. When we are talking of restoration, it's very wide. You're restoring uh, diversity, you're restoring uh, you know, uh, different type of things in different places, and the actors are so diverse. So uh, it is important, uh, lastly, just to say it is important then it is resourced. Uh, coordination does not just happen. It, it has to have money put up against it because traditionally, we have projects that we think, we, we look for physical things, water, things like that, but actually, time and the money must be put against to ensure there is a good coordination. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the last question before we close this session is from Elias Obuyu. Does the master plan the principal secretary mentioned include business models that can engage investors in the sector? The plan can identify ways not only to restore, but also to create employment and generate returns. Of course, we know that it's very important we are generating employment. So I think his Elias is asking the master plan that the principal secretary um, uh, mentioned. Um, uh, I don't know, I think um, the PS already left, um, but uh, if there's anybody who'd like to tackle that question from the government side, please feel free. But I'd also just like to mention here that uh, uh, we, we really want to move to the next session. So there are so many questions in the Q&A. I encourage all the, the presenters to go into the Q&A and look at the questions that are relevant to their um, you know, institution or, or area of expertise and answer them. So um, just a question there, maybe anybody who's aware if, if, if uh, PS uh, Professor Hamadi Boga has already left, does the master plan uh, involve, um, does it involve any kind of business sector models? Or if not, so then what we can try and do is to get the master plan and share it. Yeah. So since PS Boga is not there and I don't see anybody volunteering, maybe from the ministry to answer that question, what we'll do is we'll gather the master plan and we can be able to share it uh, with the participants and we can be able to see whether it does involve a, a business model. But I think it's critical to have that element of, of income generation, creating employment within restoration processes. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to hand over now the next session to Dr. Jen, Jen Jugona of Kefri to continue with the facilitation. Thank you, Dr. Susan, and welcome again members. We thank you and we thank the presenters for the first session. It was great to hear all of you. And we also, we apologize for the time. It's really short. It is not enough to share all that each person has. As uh, we, Susan has said, we are planning and hoping to have a, a whole day seminar where we can just talk and share. What I like about this, uh, this period of COVID is the fact that uh, we are able to interact a lot of us. I can see we are 176 participants. In, in, a, in a session that is so important, the restoration is very important to all of us. 
And for, for us, as we continue, let's know first of all that to restore is command given to us by our maker God Almighty in Genesis 2.15. I forgot to say that in, in the beginning. So our work now is to obey that command in developing nature-based solutions and solutions that are also, that also be pleasing to our God. I've seen a lot of questions, uh, very good questions in terms of um, how shall we ensure the 10% recover? That was for the PS and Boga. So I hope uh, the, the staff from the Minister of Agriculture uh, can pass that question to him so that he's able to, to assure members. I've also seen a very interesting question in terms of is restoration, is it an economic activity? And as we move on, yes, it is. Restoration, if we look at all the activities that, are, that have been presented and what the CCF has talked about, the whole value chain from the, the, red, the tree nurseries, the tree seedlings, the, you know, the whole, the whole thing is supposed to ensure that we, and we make money so that it, restoration makes sense to everyone. And I want to invite the first presenter, Brian Muzoka, to lead us through his topic on the county integrated monitoring and evaluation system. And Mr. Muzoka, you have five minutes. Uh, let's stick to the time and share as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daktari, and uh, all protocols observed. You will allow me to proceed to my presentation. My name is Brian Muthoka, heading the uh, Water, Forestry, Mining, Environment, and Natural Resources Management Committee at the Council of Governors. Uh, CIMES uh, simply serves as a vehicle to build partnerships. Um, within governments and between national and county governments, the private sector, uh, civil society and development partners. This particular system is meant to improve um, the, how we communicate and how we share our data, which is prepared through a consultative process, just like the way the county integrated development plans are, are prepared. Uh, the SIMS also follows the same procedure. Uh, the SIMS is used to track the implementation of projects and also programs outlined in a medium term uh, development plan and also the CIDP and, and among other projects uh, in county governments, which may be um, either supported by development partners, uh, civil society and other uh, willing groups. Uh, this simply uh, implores upon every one of us because this, this system uh, demonstrates how interleague uh, the, the process of uh, collecting the data uh, relies on each and every other institution because the data used from uh, SIMS uh, is informed by service and also administrative data that is collected by county governments, uh, the, uh, the county government statistics offices, the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, mm -hmm. and the national government agencies in county governments. And uh, the, it, it depends on a lot of linkage between the two. Uh, please proceed to the next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is just an illustration of how uh, the sources of data for SIMS and uh, as I indicated, we have the agencies within each uh, county government, the county statistics offices themselves, other county departments and also national government agencies within county governments. And this data uh, simply um, will pro provide the, the linkage of these uh, as uh, demonstrated in this uh, structure. Um, it depends on a robust county statistical information uh, database that helps to provide uh, uh, and supply reliable and timely uh, statistics needed to for MNT uh, or key performance indicators outlined uh, in the CIDP. Let's move to the next slide. A lesson learned from uh, implementation of SIMS and the gaps. Um, uh, one of the key lessons drawing from uh, classical examples from county governments that have really rolled out the themes uh, is that MND requires a lot of involvement of all stakeholders. And more important is the formulation of necessary uh, policies and also bills, such as the MND bills, that operationalizes the um, MND committees at the grassroots, which enable the, uh, the monitoring of programs and projects at community level, and also the establishment of county, uh, sub county. MND offices and also the uh, county MND committees. The MND has also helped uh, 
the, in the realization of performance targets by the county departments, and also this is a key uh, measure of performance in, in terms of realizing what is outlined in the annual development plans and uh, other uh, blueprints for development in the county governments. Gaps that are drawn from these, I think, are due to the demand to, uh, for GIS, I think automation of the MID systems, uh, which helps uh, uh, all actors and all those are interested in retrieving data and information uh, to access all key performance reports and uh, any information needed at a click of a button. And also there's a big gap in terms of uh, the development of an MND policies uh, but the council has continued to implore upon county governments uh, to put in place these policies so that we can have a robust MND system and also the realization of the objectives of the county integrated monitoring and evaluation system, which uh, to a larger extent informs the national integrated monitoring and evaluation system. Uh, thank you, moderator, and I submit. Thank you so much. You are so much on time, Brian. I wish to call the next speaker, uh, Patrick Mugi, to take us through the FAO restoration tools, and then we have a good uh, Q&A session. Patrick? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Good morning. My name is Patrick. I work with FAO monitoring and evaluation, and I'll be presenting the tool for land monitoring called uh, Collect Earth. Uh, <coughs> Collect Earth is uh, a free and open so source software developed by FAO as part of an open forest initiative for environmental monitoring. We have other softwares within this, uh, for example, uh, Open Forest Collect, Open Forest Collect Mobile for Socioeconomic, and uh, so many others. You can access this on www.openforest.org. So Collect Earth uh, enables uh, data collection and analysis of satellite imagery uh, through Google Earth, uh, supported also by Bing Maps and Go uh, Google Earth Engine. Objective, therefore, is to assist governments and communities and other stakeholders make informed uh, decisions on sustainable forest uh, and land management by providing up-to-date geographical information. Uh, currently, we are using uh, Collect Earth in uh, the landscapes of Mokogodo Forest in Laikipi and Isiolo counties and in Marsabit County in uh, the landscape of uh, Mount Kulai. Uh, it is also being used in the Tana Delta, uh, the UNEP and uh, Nature Kenya. Uh, next slide. So how, how does the Collect Earth uh, work? Uh, a, grid, a grid is created uh, from Google Earth Engine, as you can see uh, the yellow box. Uh, this represents uh, a plot that is around 0 0.5 hectares and uh, 500 meters or 1,000 meters apart, depending on your sampling requirements. So when you click inside that box, uh, a HTML form will appear here, where you can be able to enter your observations on land use category of each plot. Here we are using the six IPCC criteria, that is a forest land, grassland, cropland, and uh, other land settlement, and so on. And uh, by entering this data, you can also enter the confidence level of what you see. In case the images are not clear on uh, Google Earth, we are able we are supported by Bing Maps and uh, Google Earth Engine, which have a higher resolution. Like as you can see there, the, uh, the cropland. So that is a Bing Map uh, image. So from this data, we are able to uh, also check on uh, the previous uh, years because Google Earth has a feature for the current images and also historical images. So we can assess uh, what are the land use changes over a period of time. So the assessment is also not done by an individual. We use a process called Mapathon, which is a mapping event where we have experts and stakeholders with the knowledge of the local area. So this can be seen as a ground truthing uh, effort. So after this collection of this data, if we may move to the next uh, slide. Uh, this is an example of a land use change uh, that was observed in Mokogodo landscape. Uh, that was from grassland to settlement. This was uh, between the year 2006 and 2016, a difference of 10 years. So we are able to see that the grassland changed to uh, some settlement of uh, some sort. So these are the land use changes that we are talking about. And uh, from these assessments, we are able now to have an analysis, if you see in the uh, next uh, slide. This uh, is an analysis of uh, Mukogodo and Kulal. 
where we can see now, based on the six IPCC criteria, we are able to see what proportion of the area is forest, what proportion is grassland, and so forth. So what have we learned? We are, <coughs> the assessment using Collect Earth is uh, quite easy, and you don't have to be a specialist in GIS to do this assessment. But uh, on the flip side, uh, we also lack images in some years, which means we're not able to get the exact year of uh, conversion. But we have uh, other programs with land such seven and eight, which can help in this. The other thing is that uh, stakeholders who are undertaking the assessment may have different interpretations of the images that they see. One may be seeing an egg, while another may be seeing a chicken. On the summarize with so, Yes, uh, I'm finishing. So in conclusion, therefore, we are saying uh, as Kenya, we are not short of tools and technologies, as has been showcased by the partners. But our challenge is coordination, just as mentioned by our PSS, so that uh, Kenya can be able to speak in one voice and report on her commitments internationally, regionally, and so forth. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick, for also keeping uh, time. The first two presenters have been very exact on time. Now I call upon Tor Bagen to tell us about uh, restoration from the ICRA point of view. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick summary of uh, some of the work we're doing as part of a project called Regreening Africa, where we are monitoring interventions and impacts of land restoration across eight countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see the countries on the map there, and Kenya, of course, is one of those countries. Uh, next slide, please. So. Basically, in Regreening Africa, one of the objectives is to support strategic decision making. So at ECRAF, uh, we have been focusing now for several years a lot around how we take the kinds of science and the evidence that we generate from our science and bring it to stakeholders. And how do we facilitate that process and how do we sort of optimize how stakeholders, um, how we deliver this kind of information to stakeholders. And this, of course, is a is a is a long process, and it's 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 really interesting. There's a lot of very good insights coming out of that. So this is part of what we're doing to sort of support strategic decision making, and we look at a number of different uh, indicators. So there's vegetation cover, of course, uh, including also biodiversity aspects of that, uh, land management, land degradation status, including soil erosion and and um, compaction. Uh, we look at hydrology, such as infiltration capacity, and then we have a number of different soil health variables that we look at um, in, across a network of sites. Next slide, please. So basically, by building on this global network that we've been expanding gradually through a number of different projects, uh, now it's in 45 countries. So this is the land degradation surveillance framework, and it's a systematic way to assess soil and ecosystem health in landscapes. And it also gives us data that we can use to train models um, using machine learning algorithms to predict uh, vegetation cover, uh, the occurrence of various types of species, and also soil properties. Next slide, please. Um, because um, at the end of the day, uh, in regreening Africa as well, it's not just about vegetation, right? It can't just be about vegetation. It is about the, over the whole system. And so what is land restoration activities, what are these activities doing in terms of impacting the whole system? Are they reducing land degradation such as erosion, which you can see a map of here on the right for Kenya from 2019? Um, and are they impacting um, the system in terms of increasing carbon, which you can see here in the map on the left there, with, which is carbon for Kenya 2019 from our models based on that network that I showed you in the previous slide. So that's some of the science very, very quickly. Um, but we also work, next slide please, with uh, stakeholders. Um, you can tap, click on that one one more time, I think. And um, it basically using uh, citizen science data collection tools. So th these are tools that, um, that various types of people use or stakeholders use. So that in the, in the context of regreening Africa, these would be implementing partners that could be co-scientists, uh, extension agents, lead farmers, nursery managers, etc. So with this app, uh, we, we're collecting information around activities related to tree planting, farmer managed natural regeneration or FMNR, nurseries and training activities. Next slide, please. 
and it's available for free on the uh, Google Play Store. So feel free to go and download it. Just search for Regreening Africa on the Play Store. So this is an example from Kenya of some of the data that's coming in <coughs> using the app uh, around farmer managed natural regeneration. So you can see here some of the dominant species um, in that are in, in FMNR systems here. And the users also walk the boundary of these fields. So on the right there, you see uh, the boundary. Next slide, please. And the same goes for, for tree planting activities as well, where we can also, where we can look at the boundaries of the actual fields where interventions are going in. Uh, individual trees are geo-referenced and identified. And we can look at where are trees being planted within these farms. So we can go beyond just looking at sort of percentage cover, but also where are these trees planted? What are they used for, et cetera, et cetera. And then by having these boundaries, um, we can overlay that information that I showed you earlier on, uh, on around land health, so soil properties, land degradation. Next slide, please. And through that, we can basically start building tools and dashboards that the users can use. So this is an example uh, for, for Rwanda, but we're doing the same in Kenya. So basically by having the indicator maps and the field boundaries from the app is along with our science that we have through the LDSF, et cetera. And then we co-design together with stakeholders. This is the last slide. To summarize. So then we co-design these dashboards with stakeholders to basically bring this information back to them. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, did we lose him? No, I was finished. Thank you. Hello. Hello, did we lose Tor? No, no, Dr. Hari, I think maybe your connection just dropped. Tor is finished. Is it my end? And we're, yes, we're on to the next presentation. Please move okay. forward. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, my name is Talia Laini. It's a pleasure to be here today from the Global Evergreening Alliance where I work in monitoring and evaluation and manage our monitoring platform, the Global Restoration Monitor. So the Global Evergreening Alliance works alongside local communities, farmers and leading research, technical development and conservation organisations to support land restoration projects globally. We work together to enable small scale farmer, pastoralist and forest dependent communities to restore their degraded lands and improve the sustainability, profitability and reliability of their farming and forest systems. We have launched the Global Restoration Monitor to represent the global movement on land restoration with a key focus on local action. The GRM is an online platform that utilizes ground level data to track global land restoration projects spanning from large multi-country programs to local grassroots initiatives. The GRM places communities and local realities at the heart of restoration. Therefore, we place significant focus on the sustainable development of smallholder farmers. And through the GRM, we showcase stories from the farmers and communities that are engaging in restoration work. A key focus of the GRM is to provide clear visibility to existing and planned land restoration projects. The integration of a broad range of data from restoration at multiple scales increases accessibility and strengthens the capacity for greater collaboration, knowledge sharing and impact on the ground. We do this through the use of consistent and relevant indicators and data collection tools with an equal focus on socioeconomic and biophysical outcomes. Some of our key indicators include total land under restoration, number of women and men trained in restorative methods and the number of households that are practicing those methods, number of trees under management and the tons of carbon sequestered. To work towards consistent data collection on the ground, we have been developing mobile phone surveys together with input from our member organizations. These tools are designed to support holistic programming and gather appropriate data aligned to our core indicators. They will be suitable for individual farmers and cooperatives that are implementing restoration practices on small farms, large sites or rangelands. The tools are currently in their pilot phase and once finalized will be available to freely download via the GRM. Monitoring trees outside of forests provides many challenges and we are actively working with our partners to explore methods that will support our field tools and provide an additional line of evidence for the field data. This includes collect earth and other remote sensing approaches. All of our updates on our methods will be provided through the GRM. 
Currently in Kenya, we have 10 projects represented from three of our member organizations, World Vision, Self-Help Africa, and Just Dig It. Seven of the projects are ongoing and one has just commenced and they work across the areas of agroforestry, FMNR, and forest and land rehabilitation. Having a deeper understanding of restoration in action is key to scaling its potential. Therefore, we would expect to see the coverage of Kenyan restoration projects expanded. To achieve this, we are actively working with our member organizations to integrate their project data into the GRM, as well as scooping organizations working in land restoration that are beyond our member network. Access to meaningful data on the ground, as well as effective monitoring and reporting systems are critical to the facilitation of further work, funding and implementation of forest and landscape restoration. We place significant focus on sharing our methods and approaches to implementing and monitoring land restoration projects through the GRM. A big part of this is the emphasis on consistent monitoring. Therefore, we see huge, huge potential to integrate the FLR monitoring and reporting framework into the platform to allow for greater synergy and collaboration among organizations and donors working in Kenya. Connecting the GRM to both regional and national reporting will help us to tell the story of restoration more accurately and effectively, ultimately becoming a useful tool for organizations in Kenya to see their work represented in the global context of FLR. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to continuing these discussions. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I understand uh, my co-facilitator is facing the same challenges I had in the beginning. So I'm going to jump in here. A brilliant uh, presentation there. Um, and so, uh, Talia, we are going to move uh, immediately to the last session now with Mika presenting a, a survey results from a quick survey that we ran before this webinar. Mika, over to you, please. Thanks, Susan. And I'll be quite brief to allow some time for questions and answers in the final discussion. So we, we shared a survey uh, just over a week ago with many of the participants to try and start gathering a little bit more information about the restoration projects, uh, the tools, challenges, etc. So this is just a snapshot and we want this survey to continue and the link will be shared in the chat so that everybody can hopefully fill this survey and add more information. So, so far we have had 15, uh, 17 different projects fill the survey and of those 17 projects, a number of them shared the targets that they have, which is just under 470,000 hectares in terms of targets with just under 90,000 hectares achieved so far from people's reporting, as well as a number of reports around kilometers where it came to seed boils or along rivers. The restoration practices within these projects varied greatly, but there are many on rangelands, FMNR, tree planting um, and conservation broadly. Uh, next slide, please, Marion. And as you can see, these projects took place are taking place in a number of different counties. Some counties, there are multiple projects, so up to five, like Lake Kipia. Other counties, like Isiolo, Samburu, and Masabit, there's three projects, uh, Isiolo, four projects. And a few of the projects take place over the whole country, but many of them are very specific to counties. The different organizations that are implementing these projects vary. It is fantastic to see a very strong presence of private sector, up to almost 30% and non-governmental organizations around 20% with community um, and based organizations present as well as national government, county government, research, et cetera. And as we get more information and as more people fill this survey, we'll be able to do greater analysis and share more results. Next slide, please, Marion. When we asked people what type of indicators they were measuring in their project, you can see that there's a great variety. We've grouped some of these together and it's very clear that many of the projects are measuring the hectares. So this is either of land planted, restored, reclaimed, um, managed. Also the number of people that are trained or community members. There's also a number of projects measuring the number of trees that are planted or managed, as well as the survival rates, germination, growth rates, et cetera. So there's many different indicators we can see over these restoration projects. Last slide, please, Marion. And when we're looking at the tools that the different projects are using, many of the projects are actually using photos before and after, and then many are using um, uh, satellite imagery, remote sensing, phone apps are quite present, so is community feedback and surveys, but there's very many specific tools as well and quite a wide range. 
there were many challenges that were, were shared in terms of using these tools, deploying these tools. Some of them included the cost of the tools and the time needed to implement them, the capacity of those that we were expecting to use these tools, the technology available, image resolution, applicability across different initiatives, accuracy, as well as that many of the things that we're trying to measure in restoration take a, can take a long time to show and that this is one of the challenges. So that's a brief summary. Zanelle, I hope you will share the link in the chat so that other people can also fill this survey. It's really useful to guide the process to be able to see what people are doing, what tools they're using and the challenges so we can work towards addressing them. Thank you very much, Susan. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mika. And let me just tell you, we ran this survey very quickly a few days before this. And so the survey remains open. Feel free to share the survey. Put in, if you're doing restoration activities in Kenya, fill in the survey, share with your networks, because this is also one way of us understanding what is happening and then reaching the monitoring framework that we are hoping we'll be able to work together as partners who've been working on this all along. So there are many, many questions here. This last session, we are supposed to look a little bit at uh, some of the questions again that we may not have been able to address. And um, uh, as a moderator, I'm actually spoiled for choice, uh, but also very conflicted because they are excellent, many interesting questions. Some of them are being answered. So if the question is answered, it goes to the answer session and the one that is still open is left at the open session in Q and A. So, um, I'd just like to quick, quickly pick a question um, um, from Kamau Linhart. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, thank you for organizing and participating and sharing this event. I have a question to all who find it relevant. How can the public sector in Kenya better monitor, report, and validate in line with the landscape approach? So uh, do we have any kind of uh, engagement with the private sector? How can they be able to do that? That's the question that Kamau is posing. Um, and so uh, Mika, um, I'm going to hand over that question to you precisely because I know there's something that is cooking in terms of private sector engagement in restoration in Kenya. Mika. Thank you so much, Susan. And just to remind everybody, this webinar is part of a series that is going towards what will be a virtual conference taking place at the end of June, early July. And the private sector engagement in restoration is one of those themes that has come up many times. So we've just confirmed the date and we'll be publicizing. This is around the 27th of May. We will be having a private sector webinar to look at how the private sector engagement is both driving um, land degradation, restoration, um, the resources that can be made through that and the enterprise solutions to restoration. So thank you, Susan. Brilliant, thank you. Teddy, we are very, very glad you joined this meeting. Question from Teddy Kenyanjui. A great presentation all around. Could you map all charcoal making sites to earmark them for rehabilitation? And I think I'd like to post that question to uh, FAO side. Uh, you showed us how you can use Collect Act. Can you use such kind of tool to map all charcoal sites making sites to earmark for them for rehabilitation? Um, Patrick, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sheila, for that question. Uh, Collect Earth, as I was saying, is uh, it's, a, it's a tool that is using satellite imagery. All you will need to do is uh, get uh, the points of where those areas are and be able to map them. So it is an all-round tool that can be used to identify or, or see anything, as long as we have uh, images uh, for, for that particular year. And it goes back to around up to 2003. So definitely we're able to see uh, some images of such sites. Brilliant, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, again, we are conscious of time and there are many, many questions. So let's continue answering them on the Q&A. And just, uh, just to mention that the last summary was supposed to come from uh, WRI, uh, Peter Dunda is unfortunately not able to join us. And so I'll provide a summary in terms of uh, the uh, discussions and what we've seen in terms of presentations today. I think the participants, you'll agree with me, there are many, many tools and activities that have been showcased here and initiatives from the government side, from our development partners, and also initiatives from the county government side in terms of uh, you know, uh, priorities for restoration, 
where we should be doing restoration, but also the activity, the tools and, 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 and uh, frameworks that, can, that are available for us. You've seen fantastic tool presented by Torvagn there, as well as Patrick on FAO side and Evergreening Alliance and many, many other tools that we've seen there. But I think we can agree here that one of the key critical questions that we need to answer is our main uh, weak, weak link seems to be on integration and coordination and coming with an integrated framework. So that's uh, observation one. Observation, so integration and coordination and understanding how we can have a framework that not just is uh, sectoral based or is for a particular project or a particular institution, but one that helps us to be able to integrate those, uh, the monitoring aspect at a national level so that we can be able to answer the critical questions. How far are we in terms of making progress towards our 10 percent recover? How far are we towards making the progress uh, on uh, 5.4 million hectares that uh, the country has committed under the bond challenge? And of course, now we have the 2.1 million hectares uh, that are reflected under the forest, the FOLAREP, that's the forest uh, landscape restoration uh, implementation plan. And the, the third point is on uh, the need to actually act on this. I think we are not uh, just uh, ho hosting webinars for the sake of webinars. We want to come together as different sectors, different actors, and perhaps you know, think about an, an outfit or a tool or, 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 or a system that can help us to be able to achieve this key problem. And so the, the, the possibility of thinking through perhaps a working group at the national level that is led uh, by state agencies and in coordination with our partners, FAO, ECRAF, uh, other partners who are listening here, it is not, uh, a, it, it is not a very far, you know, it's not a far-fetched idea that we need this kind of, of, of an outfit to help us move this forward. And so I think those are the summaries that I'd like to make on behalf of Peter who wasn't uh, able to join us based on the presentations and the discussions that have been going on, that we definitely have a lot that is going on. Number two, we need integration and coordination and we need to probably think about an outfit that helped us to be able to achieve that in terms of a working group or something else that uh, will be uh, discussed by the key participants in this meeting and as well as uh, the organizers. So I think with that, um, I'd just like to then uh, thank you so much and uh, hand over this, the last uh, closing remarks to our very, very patient and able uh, CS for Environment, Honorable Elmi, to give us his closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. And uh, thank you for everybody for being patient. I can see majority of the people are still there. Uh, mine is to say a lot of good experiences I've said have been shared and that uh, tools and technologies actually exist and therefore what is key is the coordination and uh, how we'll make it work. One of the gaps I saw was the monitoring of the prevention of degradation. As we speak and trying to restore, degradation is taking place either from development projects, from farming, livestock, a whole range of degradation is still going, human activity is going on. So the regulators like NEMA and others, should they come up together and actually start having a monitoring system and saying, if we actually reduce the, those activities. And uh, I'll give a very simple one, which came across, I came across recently. Like our tea factories use a sub, a tons of uh, tea, uh, what wood cuttings for their boilers. Can we replace it with something else in, as a source of energy and therefore, Prevention, therefore, of degradation, in my view, would be another thing we would add. As a way forward, we've talked about the master plan that exists for restoration. Can we have it all quickly uh, distributed that all people actually have? And that plan, uh, all the people who are acting, and let's take it down to the ground, uh, put their actions to the county level. And maybe prioritize the counties in terms of, again, this will be for the experts, by virtue of the percentage of uh, degradation, can we actually prioritize them and say, uh, and get our 5.1 million hectares, actually put it on the ground so that we say the next 10 years is 5.1 uh, million hectares is in area X. And uh, we've been shown by some of the presenters that it can be mapped. The, I think it became clear that we need a national monitoring framework a platform and therefore we need a lead and sub leads and uh, 
it should be beyond projects uh, because we know projects have timelines, the funding goes off and then we are back to square one. And uh, maybe this is the time we should say it's so important that it should come from the taxpayers. And we know a lead agency in government that will always be funded um, and uh, will be doing this work. And at this point, I would say, again, when the experts are meeting, you let us know if there are specific policy or, uh, you know, law amendments or things that will force people to uh, adhere to whatever you come up with. Maybe this is the time to put them in place. And uh, these platforms should be linked to the knowledge management as we were shown by Kevry. I mean, monitoring always leads to a lot of knowledge and therefore that knowledge must be captured in a way that is accessible to the different stakeholders. And uh, finally, I saw one of the participants saying, can we share the contacts of the participants and, uh, and, and the speakers particularly that had made a lot of, I think people found a lot of useful that they would like to follow up, at least if we can make sure their contacts are available to all. And that's where probably the coordination will begin. Thank you very much. And uh, have you. a good day. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Elmi. Thank you, thank you. That's an excellent summary. So um, just to close, uh, Dr. Jane Jogona, sorry, I stepped in for her when internet went off. So Dr. Jane Jogona, please, please, um, before we just finish, thank you. Thank you, my poor moderator. And I want to take this time to thank uh, our Chief Administrative Secretary for sitting in through and also guiding us in some, in some of the ways that we are going to track the restoration project. And also our thanks to Professor Madi Boga and the CCF for sitting out and supporting. This is when we see such uh, people at that level and we are talking about restoration, we are also encouraged to know that we have support at the, at, uh, at the top levels and that uh, restoration is for everyone. My only key comment is uh, to you, uh, our CAS, we want to commit that, yes, the, in the beginning, you talked about having clear timelines, and I think as the moderators and planners of, of this uh, conference, at this, in this UN decade of restoration, it is important that uh, we have a clear timelines on what we want to achieve, and we assure you that uh, you'll be having the timeline soon and who is doing what and who is doing where. Well. My other comment is uh, in this, uh, a webinar, we have learned the importance of harmony, harmony, harmony. You realize that the, the presentations that were done, uh, like uh, the, the ICT and GIS, there are two, there are three or so institutions that are talking about the same thing, and carefully also is developing or has developed an application to track the progress of 10% recovery. It is important to have a working group with, with this uh, special group of people so that they can develop and uh, provide to, to us an application that is able to track all these activities that live so that each one of us can be able to follow what is happening as such that in totality, we'll be able to tell where we are moving, how we are progressing. And uh, finally, uh, Kenya, as we have said, is not short of information, is not short of, 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 of uh, technologies, it's a matter of how we view each other. And our CES, we want to send you to your colleagues at yeah, the ministry level, because there was a question there on how the, does the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning view this restoration. Uh, we'll send you as our um, ambassador to at that level to, uh, to also know that restoration is cross-sectoral. It, it involves each one of us. It involves every sector. So we need the, the support of the other sectors so that we can succeed in restoring our earth. Otherwise, I want to thank you very much for making it to this webinar and we look forward to meeting you in the next webinar. Have a good day and God bless you. Thank you.